Peace Prize Laureate, which begins at half past 11, will take place under COVID-19 restrictions, with only a limited number of mourners joining Mr Hume's family and closest friends. In the course of this programme, we'll be reflecting on the extraordinary life and exceptional legacy of John Hume. Politician, peacemaker, civil rights activist, friend, husband, father and grandfather. Catholics here are faced with blatant social injustice in the form of gerrymander, in the form of discrimination. to march in there. Why not? It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. You can't prohibit it. Who's government? Not our government. I don't give two balls of roasted snow, Jim. What advice anybody gives me about those talks because I will continue with them until they reach what I hope will be a positive conclusion. Listen, you're in politics to solve problems, not just to win seats. I was leader of a great team of people, and all of whom have spilt their sweat, not their blood, to bring about peace and stability on our streets. This historic agreement today enables us, at last, to start that healing process. Nobody, and I mean nobody, did more for peace on this island than John Hume. Without John Hume, I think it unlikely there would have been peace in Northern Ireland. We wouldn't have the peace that we enjoy today if it wasn't for John Hume. Inside was a man who had something big to do. I would put him in the same breath as Parnell, Daniel O'Connell. We are learning in Northern Ireland difference, whether it's your race or your religion or your nationality, is an accident of birth. And it's not something we should be engaged in conflict about. It's something we should respect. Some memories of the late John Hume were joined here in studio by former president Mary McAleese. A very good morning to you, uh, morning. Mary McAleese. And thanks for coming to, to thanks talk to us asking. this morning. Um, we, we heard you remarking there that uh, in uh, that report that nobody had done more to deliver peace on the island of Ireland than John Hume. And I think there are very few people who would disagree with that uh, contention. But what was it about his approach, his determination, his commitment that enabled him to succeed where so many others had tried and failed? We could analyse that for a very long time, but I think it was the authenticity of his vision. He was a brilliant analyst. He was an historian, but he was first and foremost a teacher. And I think we were all his pupils. He, his classroom became Stormont, it became Westminster, it became the European Parliament, it was the American administration. He was a teacher par excellence. And he had a message. He had analysed our situation in Ireland mm -hmm. and analysed it brilliantly. But he was, his analysis was so far advance, in advance of our thinking, our small, mm -hmm. narrow thinking, that he had a job of work to do to persuade. So he became what he was, the arch persuader. Mm -hmm. He had a genius for persuasion. He had a genius for arriving into the offices of the right key influencers uh, and persuading them of the integrity of his vision, his values and his principles. Say a word about his consistency, and it's something I want to come back yes. uh, to, and you've alluded to it there, right from back in the 1960s when he started to appear uh, in the media speaking about the issues yeah. that faced Northern Ireland. His message was the same year after year, decade after decade. Unchanging, pledged to non-violence. And given our history of paramilitarism and violence over and the gun and Irish politics for centuries, his pledge of non-violence was absolutely 
key to understanding this man. Uh, he, he stood his ground. There's a wonderful phrase, and um, I think Seamus Heaney really wrote his epitaph in, mm. um, in the, from the Canton of Expectation when he talks about the one um, who stood his ground. Mm. And he was the man who stood his ground. And he stood his ground for all those years, no matter who pressed on him or what pressed on him to change his mind. Mm. And the irony of it is, he was impressing on all of us the need to change our minds. Yeah. There is a kind of an irony there. He was the supreme teacher, right. the supreme pragmatist, ironically, at the end of the day, teaching us about compromise mm -hmm. and the compromise necessary to be reconciled in peace. Right. And that is something we will discuss with you and our other guests uh, in the course of the next little while. But let me go to Derry because uh, at St. Eugene's Cathedral uh, is uh, our Northern Editor Tommy Gorman uh, standing by um, with the, uh, the uh, arrangements that are unfolding there for us, Tommy. Derry saying goodbye today to one of its own. That's right, Brian, and some of the dignitaries who are able to attend have already arrived. The likes of the President, Michael D. Higgins, uh, the Taoiseach, uh, Micheál Martin, uh, Simon Coveney, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and of course, members of John Hume's family are already here. Some of them are in the Bishop's House behind me. They'll make their way across to St Eugene's Church in the next few minutes. A lot of the old guard of the SDLP are here to form a guard of honour. I saw Austin Curry, uh, Margaret Ritchie, Alistair MacDonald, Dr Joe Hendren in his late 80s made it here as well. And the irony is that this would be a much bigger gathering but for the COVID-19 situation. And you see people in the background wearing their masks. The family asked people to actually stay away to observe social distancing in a very real sense. And for that reason, only 100, 120 people will be in the church itself. I was speaking to Phil Coulter, uh, the man who wrote The Town I Love So Well, and he's going to perform that on the piano as the coffin of John Hume is carried from St Eugene's uh, at the end of the Requiem Mass. One of John's sons, Aidan, isn't able to come from Boston for the funeral, observing social distance. What a difficulty that must be for a young man not being able to come to his father's funeral. There will be a poem by Aidan Reid. John Hume's son, John Junior, will address the congregation. The priest, uh, the uh, administrator here in St Eugene's, Father Paul Farron, will deliver the homily. So the Mass is expected to begin at 11.30 and then John Hume will be buried here in his native city in the town he loves so well. Brian. Tommy, thank you very much for that. Well, we're joined now by... Uh uh, two of those who no doubt were not for COVID restrictions would be attending the funeral in Derry today, former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern uh, and John Hume's great uh, friend uh, who joins us from Derry, uh, Dennis Bradley, former uh, Vice Chair of the Northern Ireland Policing Authority. Thank you both for uh, joining us this morning. Perhaps, Dennis Bradley, I can come to you first of all with your thoughts on this morning as you prepare to say farewell to someone who was a friend for a time, I think, when you were a, a, in school, a, a teacher, but uh, as Mary McAleese was reminding us here, someone who uh, throughout his political career was uh, somebody who was always uh, a teaching and guiding. Yeah, I think those words are right. Uh, I, he taught me history, actually, way back in the early 60s in St. Columns College. And he, he was a young teacher and I was a very young student. And there's always a strange relationship uh, between a teacher and a pupil throughout the life. There's always a, a kind of a respect which goes beyond the norm and which in many ways bonds you, but also kind of keeps you a slight distance uh, because he was my teacher at one stage um, but he was a very good teacher and he was very challenging and he was I think thinking out some of the ideas uh, even at that time around how you bond nationalism and unionism together and how you begin to tackle and approach the, the, the Anglo-Irish problem. Um, then I came, began to come across him I actually was was served in the cathedral for a very short period of time and him and I used to run into each other. This was in the early 70s when I came back from Rome and we were on the streets. He was on the streets very, very, very often. Uh, and I think that engagement with his own people, the knowledge of his own area, served him very, very well because when the hard times came, uh, he knew the issues and he knew the people. He was very good at sending out people and listening to people, sending out people to find out what was going on, but also going to the places. During the civil rights, I used to hear this when I arrived in Derry, that he used to spend a lot of time in the dockers, 
I used to go into the Dockers pub and listen because the Dockers were very important in Derry at, mm -hmm. at one time. That, that kind of dissipated. But he always had that ability to go out uh, and listen and hear and, and, and know what the issues are. Yeah. Uh, I then came, him and I kind of had a, had a very famous day on the Lonemore Road, just outside his own house or very close to his own house, with Paddy Ashdown, where we got kind of we got water spilt upon us by the British Army, and we sat down and protested. He was incredibly courageous. Mm -hmm. He that physicality. You knew when you were with Hume, you were with somebody who wasn't going to desert you, who wasn't going to leave you, who was up for the battle. And I don't mean that in a bad sense. I mean that in the battle of whether mm -hmm. it was verbal or whether it was emotional. But he would have been there on your side. I saw him go through. I saw him. I was around, he used to come into this house actually during those years of almost, the, particularly the nine months uh, when the Sinn Féin, but particularly the IRA, were very slow to call the ceasefire. Yeah. And those were the years, I think, of massive suffering, both politically, but much more important yeah. emotionally. And that, is, and that uh, Dennis, is and something... And I think that he suffered yeah. then in a way which was, which was too much. Yeah, I mean, that's something I do want to come back to, but I also I want to just bring in Bertie Hearn here, if I can, um, uh, and maybe we'll see some photographs or some pictures of, of some of the mourners arriving at the church just while uh, uh, while we're talking there too. Uh, there's Arlene Foster. Uh, sorry, Bertie Hearn, I'll come to you in a moment. We're just looking here at some pictures from St. Eugene's. Uh, Arlene Foster, the uh, uh, First Minister and Northern Ireland Executive uh, and leader of the, uh, the DUP, she's arriving there for the, uh, the funeral service. A very limited number of VIPs. Uh, Michelle O'Neill, Deputy First Minister and leader in uh, Northern Ireland of uh, Sinn Féin. Uh, she arriving there to join, as I say, a very small group of uh, political VIPs uh, who will be attending this uh, funeral service. Lim numbers very limited, as we've been saying, due to the, uh, the COVID restrictions. As Tommy was telling us earlier, uh, the uh, uh, Taoiseach, uh, Michal Martin, uh, there he's arriving now. Uh, uh, again, among that small group, uh, and uh, just uh, many of them are wearing their masks uh, and keeping uh, social distance. Um, very strange way to uh, obviously to uh, uh, say a final farewell to such an extraordinary figure. It would be a very different occasion were it not for the pandemic. Uh, but yet, those who have the opportunity to attending there to pay their respects. Uh, Bertie Ahern, who joins us from Kerry. Bertie, uh, so many aspects to. Uh, John Hume's political career and his personality, but talk to us a little bit about this uh, characteristic of the persuader, somebody who listened, Dennis Bradley was telling us, but also, as Mary McAleese was saying, somebody who taught and persuaded and constantly sought uh, to, to make the, the case for the political argument that, uh, that he believed could deliver peace. How did you encounter uh, John Hume as a persuader? Well, he was an extraordinary individual, and like we say farewell today to a person who was there for the civil rights um, marches, the, the early period uh, of agitation and for, and by peaceful means, and we shall overcome, which was um, one of his great phrases. And um, then through the Sunningdale talks, where he was part of that, uh, the Anglo-Irish talks, uh, and then on to the Good Friday Agreement. So, you know, and then on to the setting up of the institution. So a period of 50 years uh, and, you know, for over 40 of that, uh, he was there with the constant message uh, that there was another way, that it didn't have to be violence, we didn't have to be spilling blood, uh, that uh, if, we, if we worked uh, together, if we found common ground. And, you know, he, he, he was at that, as you know, everybody's saying, all, mm. all his life. And uh, I remember being in, when I was Minister of Finance, uh, being way, way back in Brussels, and I was amazed to find that Ian Paisley and Jim Nicholson himself uh, were working on, for farmers in the north together. And this was when uh, the relationships in the north were re really very low, when the 91, 92 talks were, were on. Uh, so he, 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 he was finding common ground, not, not just on the troubles, but on other ways of people working together uh, to make progress for the north. And I was with Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy and him back in 1983 with the vice president mm -hmm. uh, in the States. He was working to try to get investment into the north and particularly into Derry. Uh, so I think he, his, his entire life um, was a, an agenda uh, of trying to make progress, of trying to find compromise, uh, of trying to articulate the problems of the North. But far more than that, I, you know, in the last few days, a great time to celebrate. But I don't think I ever had a conversation 
with John Hume that I didn't end up talking about the credit union movement because yeah. he thought that brought the whole spirit of the ordinary uh, man and woman of the, of the island of Ireland together. So, you know, I think his, his entire life uh, from his teaching days right through uh, to his illness have been about trying to make progress. Well, I think as we've been uh, alluding in the conversation over the last little while, John Hume was very much a dairy man through and through. Um, and it was the social issues gripping the city in the 1960s that initially drove him onto the streets to protest. Lack of housing for Catholics was the catalyst for his political career. We were refused planning permission for the 700 houses because it was in the wrong area of the city and would have upset the, the, the balance. And that brought home to me. Up until then, I was totally non-political, believing we can do it ourselves, ignore politics and build. Then the real politics came home to me and that's when I went to the street to protest. And Barry McAleese, it's very interesting if you read John Humes, I think he wrote some articles for the Irish Times in the 1960s talking about just those uh, social issues, but saying that Northern Catholics, nationalists in Northern Ireland, had to engage with the state. They couldn't abstain, they couldn't stand back. And he was, that's really been a, a characteristic, hasn't it? To engage, talk, get stuck in and try and make a practical difference. Exactly, that was the thing, that was the difference that he wrought. Again, if you go back to Heaney, he writes in that poem about the, from the Canton of Expectation about people living under you know, these high-banked clouds of resignation mm. um, where they had, the Catholic population, had fallen into a talk among ourselves but don't do anything, really. If you remember, um, and I remember, John was very, very hard on his, the early generation of nationalist politicians whom he felt were, felt were mm. ineffective. And what he wanted was for us to move out of that those blank, high banked clouds of resignation to take control. My first encounter with him was I was thir 13 going on 14 um, in our down, 70% unemployment. Mm. And this young man came to our parish to tell us about the power that we had as, a, as people who were quite poor with our halfpennies and pennies that we could put them together and create a new form of power, mm. of soft power. And that was the power of the credit union. And I remember being there that night in, the, in our parish hall with my grandmother and a light bulb went off in my head. Mm. I had never, ever thought of that before. And from that day, I became a John Hume acolyte. I would have stood with him on any platform, um, stood behind him, yeah. even through all those years when he was absolutely stressed out by the pressure from not just uh, Northern Unionists who naturally were yeah. resentful of him and quite fearful and even envious of his phenomenal communication skills, yeah. but his own people, um, Republicans and indeed the media uh, and indeed even people within his own party who yeah. gave him such a really hard time. Uh, the stress of that, I think, still, you know, it still is hard to accept that a man of such great integrity and decency and 50 years of of hard, hard grind and effort for which there was no money and in, the, mm. in those years there was no recognition. There was just hardship. Yeah. He stuck with it. And it's hard to think uh, today, you know, that he, for the last 10 years or so, is unaware of how mm. much love there now is for him and, and recognition. And, and, and Dennis Bradley, if I can go to you, how important in those, particularly those difficult times, um, when he, maybe he did question, I don't, I, I don't know, you can perhaps enlighten us, uh, but he must certainly have felt enormous pressure. How important was Derry as a place of refuge and his family and home and community? I can't hear. Can you hear me, Dennis? I've lost the sound. Oh, we've lost, we've lost the sound. We've lost the sound with Dennis Bradley. Um, maybe I can just pick up then with, with Bertie O'Hearn, if I could, on, on that. The, 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 the difficult er period, uh, Bertie O'Hearn, when he was trying to build the peace process, talking to Gerry Adams, taking a lot of criticism for that. Um, how do you think he coped with that? Was it this single-minded vision that got him through? Uh, how did he deal with uh, the, the flack that he was taking, the political criticism? Well, you know, he didn't like it, um, Brian, quite frankly, um, and he, he didn't quite understand it either. Um, he, he, he believed uh, that what the road he was on was going to work. He believed that the secret meetings he was having and the public meetings mm. were going to work. He believed that he would get to it to a ceasefire in 94 uh, and that that would... Good. The only time I ever think I saw John that... Uh, he, he didn't have a quick solution because his normal thing when I'd meet him, particularly in, in, in Dáil Éireann, 
um, he'd be quickly back to, well, let's try this if that's not working. And you wouldn't have a long debate with him. But when the ceasefire broke down in the beginning of 96, um, he really felt that was a, a, a bad setback because having you know, worked so hard for it and then it went down. But he quickly overcame that. And I remember in summer 97 when... Uh, Tony Blair and, uh, and I met him and Tony came over to Belfast to make the speech. He was back up again saying, you know, one final effort and, and this will work. So he, he but he, he did not like uh, the criticism. He thought it was unfair. Mm. He thought it was personalised, uh, but he did bounce back from it. And, you know, time, times moved on. And I, I was with him when some of those meetings with some of the people who um, made those comments uh, kind of made up with him again and you know time moved on he, he, he didn't hold yeah. any grudges about that but, but I mean, at the it, time he didn't like it yeah, well, it was perhaps those those talks with, with Jerry Adams were perhaps John Hume's uh, riskiest move during his political uh, career to enter those uh, negotiations with Mr Adams at a time when the IRA was still engaged in killing. He faced, as we've been saying, a great deal of criticism, but he also defended his decision. My dialogue with Jerry Adams had a clear objective, which was clearly stated, bringing violence to an end. And... Thousands of British soldiers didn't do that. Thousands of armed policemen didn't do that. But the dialogue did. And my challenge to the critics is, give me your alternative. Or would you have preferred that we hadn't talked and that the violence continued? Uh, John Hume speaking about those uh, talks with uh, Gerry Adams, which ultimately led to the Downing Street Declaration and uh, eventually to the uh, the Good Friday Agreement. These are the pictures inside St. Eugene's Cathedral. You can see there the uh, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, uh, President of Ireland, um, Michael D. Higgins, among this very much reduced uh, congregation in uh, St. Eugene's uh, Cathedral for the funeral mass. Um, not many more than 100 people will be uh, allowed to attend under the, uh, the COVID restrictions and the family, the Hume family, as we know, have been appealing over the last number of days uh, for people to respect those uh, social distancing regulations uh, to express their uh, sympathy in other ways. Light a candle in their windows last night was uh, one of the uh, the things that they had suggested that people might do, and no doubt many uh, people did just uh, that in Derry uh, and beyond. Um, Dennis Bradley, I think we have you again. You can you can hear us. Um, this question of, of dialogue, John Hume talking there about the importance, as he saw it, uh, of dialogue with, uh, with Sinn Féin uh, to try to bring about a cessation of violence Violence. Earlier, we were discussing with Mary McAleese here how he encouraged in, in the 1960s he was talking about the importance of dialogue that nationalists engage with di in dialogue with the, the unionist state. That was a, a hallmark, really, of his approach to politics and peacemaking that you speak to people, you sit down and you talk. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I feel that there's a danger that we oversimplify John Hume. I think he was an incredibly complex character. And I think uh, to deal with the Anglo Irish uh, history, you have to know complexity. Uh, and I think that part of the great frustration was he, part of his life was he was in, quite intellectual, then part of his life was he politicised himself, and then part of his life was he had to sell a singular message. And yet I think that each of those things were frustrating to him because he wanted to bring them all together. Uh, and it wasn't easy particularly to do that because quite often the British wouldn't, wouldn't engage. Quite often the Irish government wouldn't engage, or they engaged in a fashion that didn't quite, quite suit him. He changed his mind sometimes around things when he, when he discovered that's not working. That statement that all the British army on the streets couldn't bring uh, peace, so I had to kind of go and engage. You know, there's a way in which he was saying at that stage, well, the government should have been doing this. I have to do it. I have to go out and risk my party. I have to go out and risk my own self, my own reputation and so forth and stand out so that I can bring the two governments together and the men of violence uh, to the negotiating table. Now, mm. that's a complex, in, in the history of Anglo-Irish relationships, that's a very dangerous and a very brave thing that he did. And I think it needs much analysis. And I, I think sometimes it's just, oh, that's John Hume, he brought peace. But I think you have to begin to analyse, well, what stopped the peace for 20 or 30 or years? And what now do we do with the peace that we have now been gifted, particularly by, I think, his actions and by his commitment over the years and by the gestures and by the analysis that he actually brought to it? Yeah. Because Anglo-Irish agreements have been, or difficulties have been around a long, long, long time. And I think it is now... The, the real tribute and the real legacy is what does it challenge us to do? Because 
we now have a magnificent opportunity to, to, to reassess that Anglo-Irish relationship in a fashion that is now pretty much free of violence and which is highly political but has, an in, has, has layers to it that needs to be addressed. And in some ways the great pity is that Hume in his intellectual ability, uh, in his understanding of social issues and in his, inter and his particular interest and knowledge of the locality and how important a community is and how important it is have to have an identity and a rootedness within a people. Uh, and that, and I think that in some ways, and I, I, many people are saying that, you know, that there's not too many people at this funeral and that that's not what it would have been had COVID not been here. But I think this is going to be a very dairy funeral. I mean, I think last night, the bringing of John's body to the cathedral was, was incredibly gracious. Mm. And I think that the heart of Derry is in the cathedral today. And I think it will be a, it will be a fit, fitting tribute in, in a peculiar way. And as we just uh, looked there at uh, some of the images from inside the, uh, the cathedral um, and listened to Dennis Bradley describing the, the real sense of loss, I think, the people uh, across the island and certainly in the city of Derry will feel uh, and have felt, uh, will feel today and have felt over the last number of days. Interesting point that uh, Dennis Bradley makes there, Mary McAleese, and I think I heard uh, David Trimble make the same point that the, the Hume Adams talks back there in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and David Trimble wouldn't have uh, supported that initiative at all, but he said it had the effect of focusing the attention of the British and Irish governments on Northern Ireland and on the imperative for, a polit for political progress and a political settlement. John Hume was the person who saw that if you kept insisting on talking only to the middle ground, and if you kept excluding from talks those who were creating the violence, then in perpetuity you would not resolve the problem. And I think Dennis is right, this was a very complex this is a very complex minefield to enter as a human being. He could see a navigable path through, but in order to get to the, to get to the further shore, we, he would have to, somebody would have to become the persuader to the paramilitaries that there was an alternative strategy, there was a better way. And, um, and he was the man who could see that pathway. In doing that, of course, he would put himself at risk, mm. probably his party too. Um, and he would suffer the, a heap, an avalanche of indignity help heaped upon him, including accusations that he was a fellow traveller with the Provos, which he never was, yeah. of course. Um, but in doing that, because he was willing to take that risk and push forward, he led us to the further shore, as all prophets do. They're never, they're never accepted in their own land in their time. Mm -hmm. They have to live they have to live the dream, in a sense, the vision. And he did that, and he brought us there, right. well, willingly the or unwillingly. For the moment, Mary McAleese, Dennis Bradley, Bertie Ahern, thank you. Um, uh, we'll be going over to uh, St. Judy's in just a moment, but before that, among those paying their respects today uh, is John Hume's friend and fellow dairyman, Phil Coulter. He spoke to us this morning outside the church on what is an emotional day for the city. For us in Derry, we're, we're saying goodbye, not only to, like, a, a statesman, of which he, what he was, and a you know, man who was who loomed large, was a giant on the world stage, but we're saying goodbye to a dairy man. That's what this is about. You know, sure, we'll miss the pomp and ceremony of a state funeral, but what's, 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 what, what this is all about is dairy people saying goodbye to a dairy man. I mean, he was always special to us. Dairy was very special to John, so... Um, and the significance of the town I love so well. Well, apart from the fact that it's a kind of dairy anthem, for John and I, uh, it was our party piece for such a long time. In, uh, in some pretty weird and wonderful places. Phil Coulter speaking at St. Eugene's uh, this morning. We go over now uh, to guide you through the funeral mass, which will begin in just a very few minutes, uh, to Mary Kennedy and John Bowman. Grimagath Brian, well, Shomu Janish in Ordaglish, Nave Eugene, Lahaig Afra Namarov, our son John Hume, Fear Dirach, Fear Erlach, Agus Fear Orthach, Agus Far Cred of Coma, Thresto a Hail a Hort, our son Kotrima Agus Shiakana, Tashera Ashter Derigenish, Erli Nashiakana. And this funeral will be, despite the COVID 19 and the limitations that that, as you can see from the from the shot there, the sparse attendance, the necessarily sparse attendance, this will be uh, a funeral to rival those of the great Irish funerals, um, of the men with whom he has been compared, with Parnell and with Daniel O'Connell. So many people have made the comparison, particularly with Daniel O'Connell, civil rights activist and 
a man who changed Irish history as John Hume, John Hume did. Um, the soloist here is Anne-Marie Hickey. She's a parishioner in the parish of, Saint of uh, this cathedral and she's also part of the cathedral choir. And she also trained with Veronica Dunn. Aidan Watkins is the, is the organist. And this cathedral was itself built post-famine. It was built in that extraordinary 20 years Lord Lieutenant after the famine, Aida, when First Minister so many First cathedrals Minister, and churches, Party and civic Catholic churches were built in Ireland. Representatives from other churches, Curran Falcha, Rove, Eligenshaw, as Bishop of the Diocese of Bishop the Hume family, welcoming the congregation. gathers at this funeral service for John. This is at heart a family event as they grieve the loss of a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a brother, an uncle, and so on. But we all know this is not just a local event. John belonged here, but he also strode the world stage. So I welcome those from around the world who join us on television or social media platforms to pay tribute to a son of this city. Many of you would have wished to be here in person, but that's not possible for reasons beyond all of our controls. And I want especially to acknowledge the many thousands of people from this city and from around the island and these islands who would have wanted to show publicly their esteem for John and their gratitude for what he, one of them, and his family have achieved. Your participation today is as important for John Hume as that of the others here present. The world may be looking on, but this is a family in grief and at the same time in thanksgiving. They're gathered here in the spirit of prayer and they ask you to join them in that prayer rather than just as onlookers at a spectacle. As John Hume knew, living means participating, not just observing. So we gather, as the family underlined last night with the peace candles, we gather in a spirit of prayer that God's grace, which blessed us through John's life, will continue to flow abundantly on the people of this island and beyond. For he didn't just dream of peace. His life's vocation was to be a peacemaker for the good of others. Because of his past, we can face the future. A number of those who cannot attend have forwarded messages and before the liturgy begins I would like to acknowledge some of those messages to you who are present and especially to the family and to all of you who are united with us across the island and around the world. The first message came in yesterday morning was from the Vatican signed by the Secretary of State Cardinal Paralin. His Holiness Pope Francis was saddened to learn of the death of Mr. John Hume and sends the assurance of his prayers to his family and to all who mourn his loss. Mindful of the Christian faith that inspired John Hume's untiring efforts to promote dialogue, reconciliation and peace among the people of Northern Ireland, His Holiness commends his noble soul to the loving mercy of Almighty God and to those who mourn his passing. In the sure hope of resurrection, the Holy Father cordially imparts his apostolic blessing as a pledge of consolation and strength in Christ our Lord message from the Dalai Lama. I am sorry to hear about the passing of John Hume. I would like to offer my condolences to you and to the members of the family. I was pleased to be able to meet John during one of my several visits to Northern Ireland. Indeed, his deep conviction in the power of dialogue and negotiations in resolving the problem in his whole land has been an example of non-violent resolution of issues. It was his leadership and his faith in the power of negotiations that enabled the 1998 Good Friday Agreement to be reached. His steady persistence set an example for all of us to follow. Although my fellow Nobel Laureate is no longer with us, his message about peace and non-violence in the resolution of conflict, no matter how protracted and difficult it may seem to be, will long survive him. He lived a truly meaningful life. With my prayers, yours sincerely, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. From Bishop President Bill Clinton, Hillary and I are deeply saddened by the passing of our friend John Hume, who fought his long war for peace in Northern Ireland. His chosen weapons, 
an unshakable commitment to non-violence, persistence, kindness and love. With his enduring sense of honour, he kept marching on against all odds towards a, bright, a brighter future for all the children. He was Ireland's Martin Luther King, President Bill Clinton. Message from the Prime Minister. Last night a candle was lit and placed in the door of Downing Street to pay respects to John Hume, the symbol of the peace he worked so tirelessly to build. The world has lost a giant of a politician who recognised the world who have recognised the world over for the immense contribution he made to Northern Ireland. It is right this week that we mourn, but we should never forget the lasting impact that he made and will continue to have on Northern Ireland. His unending determination and courage paved the way for peace, and because of all he did then, Northern Ireland is a safer, stronger and better place. This will be his legacy and something we must all reflect on and remember over the coming days as his family lay him to rest. And finally, a, a brief version of a, a longer piece from Bono. We were looking for a giant and found a man whose life made all our lives bigger. We were looking for some superpowers and found clarity of thought, kindness and persistence. We were looking for a revolution and found it in parish halls with tea and biscuits and late night meetings under fluorescence. We were looking for a negotiator who understood that no one wins unless everyone wins and that peace is the only victory. We were looking for joy and heard it in the song of a man who loved his town so well and his missus even more. We were looking for a great leader and found a great servant. We found John Hume. Can I invite John Hume to say a few words before we begin our liturgy? Thank you, John. John Hume Jr., son of John Hume, will now welcome the mourners to the cathedral. First of all, I'd like to say a word to my brother Aidan, who unfortunately cannot be with us today due to coronavirus restrictions. Aidan, Gail and their five kids are watching us from Marshfield, Massachusetts. I would also like to mention Anya and Kevin's daughter, Rashi, John's granddaughter, who's in Vancouver and sitting up in the middle of the night uh, to watch us. And Mo and Dave's daughter, Marnie, who's in England, who, who also can't be with us today. You may not be with us in person, but we all know you're here, as does Dad. Summing up our Dad's life in a few minutes is not an easy task. For a man who supposedly only had one single transferable speech, he did a, did a lot of different things in his life. Aside from his achievements, he made us laugh, he made us dream, he made us think. He made us sometimes look at him and scratch our heads in amazement and the odd time in bewilderment. He kept the Irish chocolate industry in healthy profits for many years. Yorkies, crunchies, cream eggs, double-deckers, whispers, you name it, he loved them all. We often found it odd how a man with the intelligence to win a Nobel Peace Prize could seriously believe that crunchies were less fattening because they were full of air. <laughs> On Father's Day a few weeks ago, as we couldn't be with him, all his grandchildren posted him his favourite chocolate bars. I hear they had a lovely feast and one more. If Dad were here today in the fullness of his health, witnessing the current tensions in the world, he wouldn't waste the opportunity to say a few words himself. He'd talk about our common humanity, the need to respect diversity and difference, to protect and deepen democracy, to value education, and to place non-violence at the core of everything. He might also stress the need for a living wage, a roof over your head, the right to decent health care and to education, which was very close to his heart. If, we were he if he were here now, he might quote his, his friend, Congressman John Lewis, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago, appealing to the goodness of every, every human being and never giving up. 
Dad was a, a dairy man to his core, and those deep roots of neighbourhood and community served to nourish him throughout the difficult years. From the beginning, the European Union was like a homecoming to him, bringing together diverse cultures in an interdependent relationship, allowing for unique identities, but at the same time holding the bigger picture of unified kinship. At this time of planetary fragility, more than ever, he would be urging that we move beyond our flag-based identities and recognise that we need to protect our common home. Central to Dad's work was a deep appreciation of human interdependency. We all need one another. We all have a role to play. All our roles are of equal importance. In the last years of Dad's life, his physical and mental health became more and more visibly vulnerable. And yet, in these re those recent years, more than ever, we as a family witnessed the absolute importance of Dad's core ethos of building community based on respect and love. The kindness shown to Dad by the people of Derry and Donegal, who stopped to talk to him in the street every day, guided him to protect his independence when he was confused, and received him with gentleness when he was agitated, was a profound, a profound gift to all of us. We are eternally grateful as a family to all those that helped him over the years. In the last two years, when he lost his mobility and his sight, he moved to Owen Moore Nursing Home. In this, his last home, and it was a home, a home for all of us. All of us as a family were made very welcome and became part of a new community of families and carers. The deep attention and love shown to Dad and to the many friends he made amongst carers, residents and their families will remain a lesson to us all for the rest of our lives. During the long weeks of lockdown, when we as a family were unable to be with him, we knew that despite the major difficulties of infection management and bereavement, the care and nursing staff in Unit 1 were doing all their absolute best to care deeply for him and for all his fellow residents. We know that he continued to sing songs every day, to teach him all a wee bit of French, to tell jokes, to demand more buns and to question everyone daily about where they came from, their origins and their families. Although he remembered nothing, Dad remained deeply interested in every individual he met, right down to the end of his day. Dad was also a father, a husband, and a man who loved and cared for his family at all times. Marrying Pat Home, her mum, was without a doubt Dad's greatest achievement, and she enabled him to reach his full potential. Mum and Dad met at a dance in Borderland, the ballroom of romance just across the border in Donegal, the starting point for many a dairy family. Romance was followed by a wedding and a December honeymoon in a freezing B&B in Gardner Street in Dublin. Thankfully for Mum, the quality of the accommodation got better as the marriage went on. Our Mum, who loved, supported and guided him throughout his tireless work, and later in his frailty was his greatest blessing. None of us remember him changing nappies, or indeed putting many, <coughs> indeed any dinners on the table. What we do remember are endless coffee cups and overflowing ashtrays, newspapers everywhere, and constant stream of callers night and day to our home in West End Park. But he was there for all of us throughout our life. There were times when I think we all felt that he was absent, but he wasn't. He was just with us from somewhere else. Along with Mum, he taught us all our values and gave us all our moral compass. And for that, we will be forever in their debt. As a family, we will remember the man who was rooted in his community. A man who was most comfortable sitting in front of the TV with half a dozen crunchy bars to keep him company and his families around him. Or the old time holding court around the corner in the park bar. A man who ordered the same dinner in the same restaurants in Strasbourg and Greencastle for 25 years. I'm sure he's up there now ordering his creme brulee and off that awful sweet wine that he loved. A man who loved Derry at his best, be that promoting the candy stripes across the world or the many choirs that he brought from the city to Europe to sing in Brussels and in Strasbourg. 
a man who himself didn't need to be invited twice to lift the mic and give us a blast of the town I love so well, or Matt Highland, and many, many, many more. A man who truly believed in Derry and the talents of our people and became our greatest ambassador to the world. A man who loved Donegal and spent most of that time time in Bonberg and Greencastle and Mervaux, where he was finally able to switch off and relax and get that peace and quiet that he richly needed and deserved. The care Dad received in the last years of his life allowed him to retain his dignity, individuality and his magnificent strength of character, despite his overwhelming and growing disabilities. It allowed him to overcome. If you were here, he would urge us all to look at those young carers and the incredible and heroic daily work they do as a model for future leadership. Their ethos of deep respect, a respect for everyone, regardless of where they come from or stage of life. These are the foundation stones that are critical to all communities. The Reverend Martin Luther King might describe it as the politics of love. Dad would urge us to listen, so that in spite of it all, we shall overcome. Thank you, Dad, <laughs> for a life well lived. Loving words there from John Hume, the younger of John Hume's sons. Now, the uh, main celebrant here this morning is Father Paul Farron, who's administrator of the cathedral. And you also notice on the altar Archbishop Eamon Martin, who's from Derry and who referred to John Hume as a paragon of peace. Thank you, John. Can I invite you all to stand for the opening hymn of our liturgy? gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. We have gathered at the invitation of Jesus to share in his life as we celebrate this Eucharist. And we gather today to celebrate the funeral Mass for John Hume. In our Mass we give thanks to God for the gift of John's remarkable life. And we pray that in death, he has met our merciful and loving Savior, who has welcomed him home to heaven, where he will be reunited with his parents, Annie and Sam, 
and with Annie, Harry, Sally and Agnes and all those who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith. In this Mass we pray also for you, John's family and friends. We pray in particular for Pat. We pray for Therese and Anya and Aidan, John and Mo. We pray for Kevin, Willie, Kayla, Gail and Dave. We pray for John's grandchildren, Aidan, Michael, Roshin, Dee, Daniel, Rory, Marnie, Una, Ronan, Kira, Isabel, Eamon, Ollie, Rachel, Dara and Ava. We pray for his great-grandchildren, Evie and Cloda, and Cloda's here with us since she's just four weeks old. We pray for Patsy and Jim. We pray for everybody who is mourning today. We pray that you will find comfort and consolation in your faith in Jesus Christ, who has defeated death. And we pray for everybody, and we pray for our world, and we pray for more visionary leaders who can lead the road to peace. When we gather to celebrate Mass, heaven and earth unites in praising God. We're never closer to those who have died than when we're at Mass. We're not worthy to be here. We ask forgiveness as we trust in God's mercy and compassion. Lord Jesus, you raise the dead to life in the Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bring pardon and peace to the sinner. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bring light to those in darkness. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that, through this mystery, your servant John, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. You may be seated now as we listen to the readings from the Word of God. first reading by Mark Durkin, a protege of John Hume and successor as leader of the SDLP and deputy first minister. Mark Durkin said when he was leader of the SDLP that we in the SDLP know how the brother of the prodigal son feels. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the virtuous are in the hands of God. No torment shall ever touch them. In the eyes of the unwise, they did appear today. Their going looked like a disaster. They're leaving us like annihilation. But they are in peace. If they experience punishment as men see it, their hope was rich with immortality. Slight was their affliction, great will their blessing be. God has put them to the test and proved them worthy to be with him. He has tested them like gold in a furnace and accepted them as a holocaust. When the time comes for his visitation, they will shine out. As sparks run through the stubble, so will they. They shall judge nations rule over peoples, and the Lord will be their king forever. Those who trust in him will understand the truth. Those who are faithful will live with him in love, for grace and mercy await those he has chosen. The word of the Lord.
The second reading will be read by Trace Hume. She's the eldest of John and Pat Hume's five children. She lives in Ross now and first letter to the Corinthians. Be ambitious for the higher gifts. And I am going to show you in a way that is better than any of them. If I have all the eloquence of men or of angels that speak without love, I am simply a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. If I have the gift of prophecy, understanding all the mysteries there are and knowing everything, and if I have faith in all its fullness to move mountains, but without love, then I am nothing at all. If I give away all that I possess, piece by piece, and if I even let them take my body to burn it, but I'm without love, it will do me no good whatever. Love is always patient and kind. It is never jealous. Love is never boastful or conceited. It is never rude or selfish. It doesn't take offence and is not resentful. Love takes no pleasure in other people's sin, but delights in the truth. It is always ready to excuse, to trust, to hope, and to endure whatever comes. Love does not come to an end. This is the word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. There was a lawyer who to disconcert Jesus stood up and said to him, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. You have answered right, said Jesus. Do this and life is yours. But the man was anxious to justify himself and said to Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, A man was once on his way down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of brigands. They took all he had beat him and then made off, leaving him half dead. Now a priest happened to be travelling down the same road, but when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite who came to this place saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan traveller who came upon him was moved with compassion when he saw him. He went up and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. He then lifted him onto his mount carried him to the inn and looked after him. Next day he took out two denarii and handed them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and on my way back I will make good any extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbour to the man who fell into the brigand's hands? The one who took pity on him, he replied. Jesus said to him, Go and do the same yourself. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The musical director is the violinist Frank Gallagher. There are many tragedies in our world at this time, and there are so many awful things 
that we have to accept as normal. And one of the greatest tragedies and most awful reality is that we have to be physically distant from one another. It's not the way we're called to be, keeping people at a distance. And I know that it is necessary at the moment, and that makes it so much more painful. And it wasn't the attitude of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel today either. The first two people, they did keep their distance. They didn't get involved, they walked past. But the Good Samaritan, that person did something different. He stopped. He had compassion. He got involved. He touched the wounded person and he lifted him onto his mount. He gave him a dignity. He gave him life. And even though he didn't come from his group, he saw him as his neighbor, his brother, his friend. And this, Jesus tells us, is what we have to do if we want to inherit eternal life. We live our faith by how we treat one another, by how we give life to one another. And this is the road we need to be on if our desired destination is heaven. This is the road that God wants us to be on because he wants each and every one of us to be with him in heaven forever. This is the deepest desire of God that we are with him. And Jesus tells us it is only possible if we show compassion, if we give dignity, and if we give life to others. And John Hume, whose funeral mass we have gathered to celebrate today, never passed by on the other side. John never kept a distance. He stopped. He showed compassion. He got involved. He gave dignity and he gave life to so many people. In our time, in our world, when so often small-mindedness and self-focus seems to be the driver, John never put anybody or any specific group first. He put everybody first. He didn't focus on difference and division. He focused on unity and peace and giving that dignity to every person. And we should never underestimate how difficult it was for John to cross the road and to do what was intensely unpopular for the greater good. It was compassion, a compassion that visibly bubbled over in the graveyard and grey steel that drove John on the final and often lonely and always difficult road to peace. Even in the darkest moments, when people would have been forgiven for having no hope, John made peace visible for others. His vision revealed what could be, and with time and determination and single-mindedness, and yes, with absolute stubbornness, he convinced others that peace could be a reality. John never lost faith in peace, nor did he ever lose faith in his ability to convince others that peace was the only way. If you ever want to know a man who gave his life for his country and his health, that man is John Hume. And the world knows it. He's the only person in the world to have received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Gandhi Peace Prize, and the Martin Luther King Peace Prize. Pope Benedict XVI made him a Knight Commander of the Papal Order of St. Gregory the Great. And in the midst of all of this, as John has already told us, John was a proud Derry man, first and foremost. His commitment to Derry was second to none. His aim was to bring life and to bring prosperity to this city, to lift people out of poverty, and he did everything possible to make that a reality. He always said his proudest achievement 
was the establishment of the credit union. But my fondest memories of John weren't directly around his incredible achievements, but they were here in this cathedral. In his retirement, and as, as his health declined, every day possible, John came here to 10 o'clock Mass. Often he was late, but he always came. And every evening, he came back to the cathedral, and he sat down there at the back, and he prayed quietly. In all the houses he was in, white houses and houses of parliaments and many others, it was this house, the house of God, where he found greatest peace. It was in this house that John recognised the presence of God and his need for God and his need for God's mercy and his need for God's love. Here, before his God, the humility of John was plain to be seen. Today, we truly give thanks to God for the gift of John Hume and for all the gifts that so many people have received because of the remarkable life that he has lived and the courage and determination that he has shown. We give thanks to God for the gift of life itself that so many people have today simply because of God, John's vision of peace, of his commitment to peace, and of his ability to make peace a reality. Because make no mistake about it, there are people alive today who would not be alive had it not been for John's vision and his work. And it could be any one of us. And as we thank God for John, we pray for you, John's family, who also made massive sacrifices for peace. Your father and your grandfather couldn't be at home too much because there were too many people on the way home who needed help, and he couldn't pass anybody. But in fact, he brought many of them home. When you came down for breakfast any morning, you never knew who would be at the table from the most famous politician to a lady needing a new house. You never knew who would be knocking at your door or who tragically sometimes would be trying to burn your door down. Today, as we pray for you, we thank you for your father. And we pray especially for you, Pat. There's an old comment that says, behind every good man there's a good woman. In Pat Hume's case, this is one quarter the truth. Pat, you stood behind John to defend him and support him. You stood beside him to love him and accompany him even in the most difficult times. And when his health failed and his mind got weaker, you walked in front of him to lead him. Pat, you encircled John with love, compassion and support. And it was your presence that made his work possible. When the history of Ireland is written, if Pat Hume's name is not beside John's, it's an incomplete history of Ireland. And John and Pat have secured their place in the history of Ireland, John being elected and voted Ireland's greatest. But today we pray that John has secured his place not in Ireland, not in Europe, but in paradise. Jesus tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. Today, we can be confident that a son of God has gone home. John lived his faith in the most practical way. One of his favourite Gospels was the Good Samaritan, and it was the Gospel of Jesus Christ and Catholic social teaching that shaped John's work for peace. Our prayer today is that the peace John experienced here in this cathedral and the peace he worked to give the people of this country was just a foretaste of the peace he is now experiencing where all suffering is gone and his mind has recovered its youth, its youthful vigour. There in paradise where there is no social distancing, may John be resting in the heart of Jesus seeing the face of God forever and ever.
Amen. Father Farron there talking of John's wife, Pat, who really was his rock and at his side always. And both teachers, they married in 1960 and John was immediately active in social and community issues. the prayer of the faithful. Pat's teaching kept the family going. And she also kept his diary. She ran his office. She booked his flights. And she welcomed all comers to their house. She was a woman of great administrative and political talents. And as John said, I'm a parcel and Pat delivers me. My sisters and brothers, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for his church. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers to his. These are John and Pat's grandchildren who will be reading the prayers of the faithful. The first is Dee, who's the daughter of Anya. Aidan can't be with us today because of coronavirus restrictions, but he wrote this, these words for Dad last week and we were able to read them, and I'd like to read them here, and Aidan, you're with us in spirit. To Dad. Your friend Seamus Heaney wrote of a time when justice will rise up, hope and history will rhyme. Using a moral compass as your only tether, it was your perseverance and sheer force of will that brought them together. It began with the corrupt sighting of a university, driven by a total lack of respect for diversity. On to Stormont, Strasbourg, Westminster, even Washington DC, you showed us just how impactful one man can be. You made us realize a border is just a line on a map it's in our hearts and minds where we need to bridge the gap. Through over 30 years of violence, hurt and unrelenting stress, those underlying conditions you never stopped trying to address. Difference is but the accident of birth and everyone has the right to the same self-worth. Patriotism is the spilling of sweat, not blood. The glory of the gun is a myth that is truly a dud. You did not do it all alone, but made damn sure the seeds were sown. Leadership is the art of convincing others you're right, not being prisoner to a base or projecting might. Like any father-son, our relationship was occasionally frayed, but we were all grateful that on the course you stayed and showed us that even a wee boy from the Glen could dismantle the power of the sword with a simple pen. I don't ever think I said aloud how you've made us all so incredibly proud. All you ever wanted was to make the world a better place, and in that goal, you found your ace. That was Lord Aidan's poem for his father, Lord and read by his sister, Mo. Dear Lord, Grandad took to heart the teaching of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We pray that we continue on the path to sustainable peace, a peace that is transformative, a peace that is just, a peace that is equal and built on respect for all people and planet. Lord, hear us. Lord, That's Dee. She's the daughter of Anya, who's a GP in Derry. Dear Lord, Randall lived his faith with courage and generosity of spirit. May that spirit live in all of us so we too live courageously and truthfully. We pray for our carers and nurses, especially those in Owen Moore who took such great care of my granddad. They care for our parents, our grandparents and loved ones and in doing so, they care for all of us and our future generations. Let us not forget. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious. That was Eva, daughter of Mo Hume and Dave Featherston. There are 16 grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Dear Lord, we pray today for the many other families across our islands who have lost loved ones at this difficult time. May you comfort and support them in their grief. We pray for those who have gone before us, especially John's parents, Sam and Annie, his brother Harry and his sisters Annie, Sally and Agnes. 
Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. The next prayer will be read by Rachel, who's John. Dear Scotia. Lord, the current pandemic denies us the ability to embrace one another physically. May Grandad's vision help us to embrace each other spiritually and politically as we live in these difficult times. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. We pray that we will build on the peace that Grandad helped create by creating a community that cherishes the rich divergence of all who live in this land. We pray for communities who have been affected by injustice and conflict. May their struggles for justice and dignity be recognised. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. She's the daughter of Trace. And in silence, and we open our hearts to God. And the care home staff have been warmly. Lord, hear us. Warmly thanked there. Lord, may you support us all the day long till the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, may you give us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last through Christ our Lord. This is on Coolin, A Slow Air, performed by Porrick O'Brien on the fiddle. His mother and John were very close friends, and on Coolin is a family favourite at gatherings. Peter and Spire there of the Church of Ireland. Pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant John, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. 
In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Saviour of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your Church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one Spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Eugene, Saint Columba, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and Donal our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have called before you. 
In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant John, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly bodies after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed sisters and brothers too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. United as the risen body of Christ, let us pray with confidence to our loving Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. this stage in the Mass, I invite those of you who are joining us on television or the webcam to make your spiritual communion now. Those of you here present, if you wish to receive Holy Communion, I invite you to stand in your seat. And the Eucharistic ministers and I will bring communion to you in your seat. I would ask that you receive in your hand, and we do it in silence. So I ask you now to profess your faith in Jesus, present body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist as we pray, the body of Christ.
John Hume's destiny as a champion of the underprivileged was determined from a young age because growing up he watched neighbours who were illiterate call to his house for his father Sam to write letters on their behalf and he said that moved him deeply. And then in 1960 at the age of 23 and just married he helped establish Derry Credit Union because he hated seeing his mother and her sisters going to money lenders for loans and the banks wouldn't lend to poor people. And in 1965, he was the first chairman of the New Derry Housing Association, campaigning for social housing. And Michael Canavan uh, of the Derry uh, Credit Union is among the mourners here today, invited by the family. Um, as indeed is Richard Moore, who is the victim of a rubber bullet and blinded by that, and who later sought to meet the soldier who had fired it. And all of these people, especially selected at a family funeral, including care home staff, Amy McCallion, Paddy Hennessy, Michael Doherty, Joe Hines, Amy Denver, Una MacDonald, who took special care of John Hume during his difficult illness. Mark Durkin there with his wife, Jackie. Also helping with the communion is Canon Dinny McGettigan. Canon St. Eunan's Church in Raffo in Donegal. As with so many Derry people, um, there was no border really between Derry and Donegal. It was part of the same hinterland and a very special part of John Hume's life. Father McGettigan is famously prayed and included in, in the prayers in St. Union's Church in Raffo. He asked the congregation to pray for Colonel Gaddafi, who had just died, and he was asked, had he not been a, a murderer? And he said he needs our prayers even, even more. He also, by the way, he interceded in court for a burglar, asking the judge not to have a custodial sentence when he had burgled the, the home of um, Father McGettigan. And Father McGettigan is a, is a cousin of John Hume's wife, Pat. This music would also have been chosen by Frank Gallagher, along with the family, of course, but Derry musician, violinist, arranger, composer, and was musical director also of, of a very big funeral of George Best some years ago. It was lovely to see the, the people of Derry uh, at the railings there a little while ago. Uh, John Hume was beloved of Derry people and in later years he'd walk by the foil and um, when his memory was failing people would walk with him. Some people walked him home. As one person said, John Hume looked after us so Derry looked after him. Many of his old SDLP colleagues, of course, here, <clears throat> including one of the founders, uh, Austin Curry, who was the only member of the old Nationalist Party to join in that original six founders of the SDLP in 1970. Frank Gallagher there playing Tonshim Chulla, Er Maul Siachanta Grover, Agus Pavur Egjan Agus Pat Hume on, on Pisa Kyolsha.
You'll have seen their breed, Rogers, Dennis Hoheen, Sean Farron. Oh, Joe Hendren is also here. That's Mark Durkin, of course. And Margaret Ritchie, Alistair MacDonald. We stand to pray. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother John may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. In your seats there is a small prayer card with the prayer of St. Francis. And before we come to the end of this funeral mass, in John's name and in a commitment for each one of us to be peacemakers, we pray the prayer together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. At the end of the funeral, John's body will be brought from the cathedral and his family will follow his body and then I would ask you to wait and the stewards will enable you to leave the cathedral safely. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The remains of John Hume will be commended to the Lord Most High and then taken on its final journey to his burial place, his resting place. Our brother place. John has fallen asleep in Christ. Confident in our hope of eternal life, let us commend him to the loving mercy of our Father and let our prayers go with him. He was adopted as God's son in baptism and was nourished at the table of the Lord. May he now inherit the promise of eternal life and take his place at the table of God's children in heaven. And let us pray also on our own behalf that we who now mourn and are saddened may one day go forth with our brother John to meet the Lord of life when he appears in glory. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Saints of God, come to his aid, come to meet him, angels of the Lord. May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to Abraham's side. Give him eternal rest, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. And the Hume family have promised to arrange a memorial service and a celebration of John Hume's life in due course. Above all, they wanted um, what John would have wanted to prioritize public health and the safety of communities by this. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother, John. In the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon John in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant 
and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ. And we are with you and with our brother John forever. Amen. In peace, let us take our brother John to his place of rest. The stained glass windows there that you saw were only completed 90 years after the church was started. And this is The Town I Loved So Well, his favourite song, played by Phil Coulter. And as Phil Coulter said, they often uh, had a duet uh, at Sing Songs because uh, John Hume was a very gregarious and sociable person. And um, as his son John said, didn't have to be asked twice to sing a song, which is a a man of the people, certainly. A loyal friend since school days, Phil Coulter, and always described John as a dyed-in-the-wool dairyman. Seamus Mallon said there's a greatness about his political life in what he did and what he helped to do, and Seamus Mallon would put him in the same breath as Parnell and Daniel O'Connell. And he's been likened to both men by President Higgins, by Mary McAleese Bertie Hearn, Martin Manzer as well. This past week, this Joe Hendren, you see there beside, between me and Martin and President Michael D. Higgins. Over 20 years ago, I was interviewing John Hume at the Philosophical Society in Trinity College, and I, int- I introduced him as comparable to Parnell and O'Connell, and he smiled. He would have loved that those accolades, I think, and he deserves them. He is a giant as a figure in Irish history. Uh, And he has changed Ireland. It's very difficult to think of the country without him. Indeed, it it is John Hume's Ireland, according to what Colin Eastwood said. We now live in the Ireland he has fashioned and imagined. So the almost thine took her to John Hume and saw in a valadochish her madden, agus her foot on thawen, Dornoig. Almost a thought tilte, like a varsha, her gock quit, the fwinev, the iltacht, the shri, a quivalent fearhovach, the quivalent her son Kofima, unochish, agus shiakana. So Grimish shiakan shiri air, fearleach, nonoil. John and his sons-in-law, other members of the family, bringing the coffin of John Hume from the cathedral, a cathedral he knew so well and which has seen some extraordinary history in its long life. Applause now from the limited audience beyond the church today. This cathedral was built with the, uh, as the editor editor of the Dairy People said, it was built with the pennies of the poor, the sixpences of the not so poor, and the shillings of those with a little more. It was. It took forty years 
to finish and another 20 or 30 to finish the spire and then the stained glass. And it was Cardinal Logue's period by the time it was finally completed. Feel the emotion, um, the sadness, obviously, the, the gratitude and the pride of the, the people gathered in the churchyard as they say a, a final and a fond farewell to what the people of Derry apparently always called him, our wee Johnny Hume. May you rest in peace. Achieved interna international acclaim, of course, um, as is well known. But to the people of Derry, he was, as Mary said, our wee John Hume. And they, were, they felt deeply indebted to him for championing their cause. His, his great-grandfather, by the way, when I first heard of John Hume, he was about the university issue in the 1960s. And I linked him with Ivan Cooper. He was, of course, linked with Ivan Cooper, but I, I thought of him as somebody, as with Cooper, who was championing the, the Catholic cause and yet was, was pr obviously, with a name like Hume, um, probably Protestant. And it was, I think, some months before I realised that he was, he was Catholic. His great-grandfather was a Presbyterian from Scotland, and Hume, of course, is a Presbyterian name, um, though, as John Hume would be the first to say, um, birth is but an accident. And his father, of course, um, was a former soldier and then um, a docker, unemployed for a lot of his life. And John's mother um, did a lot of work to keep the family going. John was the eldest of seven and has predeceased by four of his siblings and his brother Patsy and his wife Bridget. We saw them going into the, the cathedral earlier on and his other brother also. And he's 16 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. One of them, um, we were told, was in the church, very brought down the average age <laughs> of the church, I think, but uh, and was very silent, mm -hmm. was well looked after. Um, Tony Blair said that he was a deep thinker, a visionary, and anywhere he'd been born, in any form of politics, he would have been a big figure. And I'm sure that's, that's the case. He, he, he brought his talents to the Irish question. Yes. Alistair MacDonald, former leader of the party. Um, and Senator George Mitchell said that John Hume was one of the greatest persons in Irish history, an advocate for and an architect of peace. See Dennis Hawhey there in the background. Um, he was very close to John Hume and edited the book with Sean Farron, John Hume, Irish Peacemaker, a collection of essays. Pat Hume's um, essay in that, by the way, is includes the fact that John, when she first met him, he was a cricketer. Uh, he was a left arm spin bowler for the city of Derry Cricket Club. And there is a pocket of good cricket played in, in Derry. It's a very patchy game in Ireland. But um, John would have been pleased to know that the Ireland-England teams both wore a black armband yesterday. And also uh, Derry City Football Club. He was a, a, a huge supporter of Derry City. I think he was president for a number of years. And they played St. Pat's at the weekend. They won. 2-0, but they wore black jerseys and also black armbands as well as a, as a mark of respect to a man they all loved so dearly and so deeply. That's John's brother, I think there on the left, Paddy, with his wife Bridget, speaking to President Michael D. Higgins. The late Seamus Heaney, who was a fellow Derry man and also a fellow Nobel Peace Laureate, um, said that 
from a very early age, he could see the qualities that would make John Hume a statesman on the international stage. He said, when I knew John Hume at St. Columns College in Derry in the 50s, he already displayed the qualities that have led him to this huge eminence. You had the impression of somebody with a very steady, moral and intellectual keel under him. Somebody reliable and consistent who operated from a principled and definite mental centre, um, which was... Uh, what Seamus Heaney had to say about his friend and, and as I said, fellow dairyman. St. Collins College, of course, uh, was where uh, John Hume was educated. It's got some two no no Nobel Prize winners mm -hmm. um, from the same generation, Seamus Heaney and uh, John Hume in different fields, but both were with extraordinary distinction. And John Hume, of course, uh, also was awarded the Gandhi Peace Prize and also the Martin Luther King Peace Prize. And Martin Luther King was a hero of his always. And uh, at the end of his speech, uh, or his lecture really, after he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, his last words were, we shall overcome, uh, quoting Martin Luther King. President Michael G. Higgins said of him through his words, his astute diplomacy and willingness to listen to what was often difficult to accept it was the view of the other John who remodelled politics in Ireland. And the bells now of the cathedral ringing out. It took, again, it took 80 years for them to be installed uh, from, the, from the, original, the original building by J.J. McCarthy of course, one of the great architects of this period in 1850 to 1870. And the bells pealing out. Um, one of the bishops said when he was collecting for, again in about 1900, collecting for the further uh, fundraising so that, so that the bells could be completed, the people of Derry wanted to hear the bells of their cathedral. And this building really took so long. It took almost a century to finish. Mm -hmm. uh, and the history of post-famine Ireland, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the carers uh, there from the care home staff, Amy McCallion, Paddy Hennessy, Michael Doherty, Joe Hines, Joy Hines, Amy Denver and Una MacDonald, who looked after him so well. The care home was the own Moore home on the Colmore Road in Derry. And... Um, John was taken from there to the family holiday home in Moville, from where he returned last evening to St. Eugene's Cathedral. And the former Taoiseach John Bruton said of uh, John Hume, he was the pivotal figure of 20th century in Ireland, reframing the problem from being one about land to being one about people. So violence and coercion became irrelevant. This was the intellectual basis of the peace process. He won the argument. And as his coffin leaves now the grounds of the, of the cathedral, we hand back to studio and to Brian Dobson. And so the cortege makes its way the short distance to the city cemetery for the uh, final burial uh, of the remains of John Hume. That is a private ceremony, so our coverage of this morning's funeral mass will conclude uh, now. As people of Derry there, you can see uh, begin to walk behind the uh, the cortege on that uh, on that short journey. Let's just uh, have a final uh, thought from our guests uh, here in the studio uh, and in uh, in Kerry and Derry. And perhaps I can come first of all to you, um, Dennis Bradley, uh, Father Paul Farron, comparing John Hume to the Good Samaritan. He said he never passed by on the other side, never kept his distance. He stopped. He showed compassion. He got involved. He gave dignity. He gave life to so many people. And indeed, he said there are people alive today who would not be alive had it not been for John Hume's work. That, Dennis Bradley, is a quite extraordinary legacy. And I think it's true. And I think it continues to be true. Uh, it was a lovely service, and I thought during it, 
If Hume had been here, he'd probably have said, but what's next? You know, politics doesn't end. Life doesn't come to an end just because somebody passes away. Um, and the real question now is that we're entering an incredibly important stage within the continuing peace process, within the continuing relationship, Anglo-Irish relationship. And I think John would have been asking all of the politicians, the Irish government, are you prepared for the next stage? You've been asking the British government, are you prepared for the next stage? Because Brexit's coming on top of us very soon. Uh, the constitutional issue hasn't gone away and will come to its, the fore in the next number of years. And I think... We need to be prepared for that, and uh, I think that all of us who who loved him um, should prepare for it properly and put our minds and our efforts to it. And, and Bertie O'Hearn, the, the peace process, the Good Friday Agreement, the institutions in Northern Ireland, we know that there have been difficulties over the years. Uh, there have been challenges. There are challenges for this generation of leaders on both sides of the border. But are the the roots that John Hume planted, are they deep enough, would you believe, to withstand the challenges that Dennis Bradley's been talking about and others that lie ahead? We lost the line. Hmm? We lost the line. So I've lost our link with, uh, with Bertie Hearn. Maybe I'll put that question to, to Mary McAmeese, who's with us. Uh, um, uh, has, has the structure, if you like, that was the, the template uh, that John Hume envisaged all those years ago, is it, do you think, strong enough to withstand what's uh, coming at it? I think it has shown itself to be remarkably robust. God knows it has been tested and seriously tested over the years since the Good Friday Agreement, but it has shown itself to have a robustness. And even in the way in which his old enemies, it might, be, you might call them, have responded to his death and now have commented on his life in language that is language of hope, uh, language of generosity. I see, all, I see in all that signs of the change that John tried to manoeuvre us all into, into being. Um, he wanted us to change. He wanted us to change the way we looked at each other, to change the way we questioned, how we examined the questions. He wanted us to compromise. He wanted us ultimately to love one another. And what came across to me from that beautiful, elegant service um, in his honour uh, today was those words of his son, uh, but his father's moral compass, his magnificent strength of character. And I think that's the legacy mm. he leaves. He calls us, he challenges us to the same strength of character, to keep on hoping, enduring, trusting one another in ways that we didn't do before, mm. talking about each other in a language of loving generosity that we didn't do before. And somewhere, I believe, that is embedded in the Good Friday Agreement. And mm. for all its ups and downs, it holds. It still holds us. And I think that there is a solidarity today that didn't exist before. And it exists thanks to Hume, the great teacher, the great persuader, the prophet. And a final word, Bertie Hearn, I think you can now hear us. Uh, what's the best way, do you think, to honour John Hume's legacy? Well, I think now it's for a new generation of politicians to continue on the work. I mean, there'll always be challenges. Uh, hopefully it'll be a peaceful society in Northern Ireland is at peace, but uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. And I think John was the great believer uh, and he, he was the person who always said it was the, the three legs of the stool, the, the three institutions, the relationship within Northern Ireland, between North and South and between Dublin and London. And I think all three of them uh, will have challenges as we go through this decade. And um, I think the legacy is for us to, to continue on what John put into it for 50 years. And that's a challenge. But I think if we believe in the, the philosophy and, uh, of what John Hume taught us, uh, we must continue that work. All right, well, we thank you for being with us. Uh, Bertie O'Hearn uh, in Kerry, Dennis Bradley joining us from Derry and here in the studio, former president Mary McAleese. Thank you indeed. That brings to a close uh, our coverage of the funeral of John Hume. We leave you with some of the images uh, from today's funeral mass as John Hume takes his final journey to the city cemetery in Derry. A very good afternoon to you.